So thank you very much, Mr. Setiarthi, for meeting with us today. My name is Sigrid Lupieri, and I'm from UNESCO's Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. As you may know, UNESCO MJP is UNESCO's first Category 1 Institute in the Asia-Pacific region, and we're working on changing education systems to create more peaceful and sustainable societies. So for my first question, I just wanted to start out with asking you a little bit about your background and what compelled you to make such a radical career change from an engineer to campaigning for children's rights? Uh, thank you very much, first of all, and welcome you. The very first day of my schooling was a spark to understand this issue of children who are out of school and children who are enslaved and working as child laborers. I saw a boy of my age sitting outside the school. He was a cobbler. And uh, when I was entering the very first day, I encountered with him. And I could not understand why he's sitting outside and all of us are going to school with new uh, uniforms, new books, and new dreams and aspirations. I asked my teachers my headmaster, my family members, everybody had replied, oh, they are poor children, and that's why they are not in school. One day I gathered all my courage and went straight to the father of the boy, who was also working and sitting alongside the boy. I was five or six years old, and so was the boy. And I asked his father that, sir, why don't you send your son to school? So he looked at me as it was such a tough question. Then he replied, uh, Babuji, Babuji means sir, because of the caste uh, system. He said to me that I've never thought about it. My father, my grandfather, and I started working since childhood, and so is my son. So nothing is special in it. But then he told me that, sir, perhaps you don't know that we are born to work. So that was his reply, but for me it was a question which I still trying to find out the answer for. Why some people are born to work? Why some children are born to work at the cost of their schooling and childhood and freedom? And why we are born with dreams and, and future? So then I started involving myself um, in trying to find not only uh, answers through my friends and relatives, but also some solutions. I started gathering old books, used books, and helping the children because their textbooks were very expensive, so I wanted to help them out so that the dropout could be minimized. I started collecting some money to uh, give the fee for those children because tuition fees was, uh, was essential those days. So that slowly and gradually uh, built up my mind that uh, I'm not born to become an engineer or I'm not going to enjoy a very usual career. I will do something else for those children. It was very tough because I come from a modest family. Uh, my father was a simple uh, police constable. My mother was illiterate and widow, uh, but she was very determined that all her children must go to school, including her daughter. So that has inspired me to finish my studies. And then I worked as an electrical engineer for about a year and a half, almost two years. Uh, but finally, I gave up my career. That was too difficult, because most of my friends um, told that you have become crazy. This is, what are you talking about? Um, but uh, it worked well. Looking back over your career, what would you say have been the biggest challenges you have faced in campaigning for children's rights? My first challenge was to establish that child labor is denial of human dignity and freedom, denial of education. It is uh, not just poverty. So establishing the fact that this is an evil this is a crime, was the biggest challenge for many, many years in the beginning because nobody was working on this issue. India did not have its own law by that time. There was no single piece of research, nothing, no knowledge about it to learn from uh, in my country. So it was very hard to establish this fact and then to challenge it. So it started from neglect and then denial and then 
reaction, sometimes the violent reaction from the employers and some mafia groups. Um, the financing prob financial problem was a serious problem. So the fight against mindset has been the biggest obstacle and it still goes on uh, to, uh, to convince the people that every single child is born with certain human rights and some of those rights are natural given by the God. A right to learn is a birthright of every child. Every child is born with a right to learn and that means education. So if anything um, is against it, we have to fight it out. But I lost two of my colleagues, one was shot dead, one was beaten to death. I have been attacked many times. I have my broken leg and my broken shoulder, my backbone is broken. So there are many, many uh, you know, injuries and scars and wounds on my body. But every time when such criminal and the mafia groups attacked me or my colleagues, uh, I gathered more strength because I was convinced that I am on right path. So it was a long fight and it will be a long fight. It's not so easy to change the world so easily. How has winning the recent Nobel Prize affected the nature of your work? It is uh, the greatest recognition mm -hmm. to the most vulnerable, most negligible, neglected, most uh, I would say deprived children all across the world and uh, that has brought uh, spotlight on these issues, the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, so we are able to bring this whole discourse to next level, to higher level or perhaps the highest level. Uh, on one hand, the common people started thinking about this issue which was not there. So awareness is growing but on the other hand, uh, the discourse has also reached to the level of presidents and prime ministers and UN agencies, heads and so on. So I am sure that it has helped a lot and it will help much more. You have said in the past that you think that it will be possible to eradicate child labor soon. Do you think that the UN's new targets, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, will be able to achieve this target? Uh, I, I, I just don't say it that mm -hmm eradication of child labor, educating every single child, giving childhood back is not a dream only. It is something which is achievable, which is attainable and we can attain in our lifetime and I am going to see it with my own eyes. So I am very, very convinced about it. It is not just an optimism but that is true because the indicators are there. The number of child laborers have gone down in last 15 years from almost 260 million to uh, 168 million. The number of out of school children have also be, has also been dropped from uh, say 120, 130 million to uh, 58 million or so. So these are strong indicators, clear indicators. Sustainable development goals are much better uh, formulated than Millennium Development Goals. Of course, the, the international community has gained a lot of experience and learning uh, from the successes and failures both. Education, for instance, is figuring out much well. The inclusion, equity, quality, these issues are uh, going in right direction. Uh, and we are considering more and more education with right perspectives. So that is important. Similarly on child labor, forced labor, there is very clear and good language about it. And the interconnectivities with the rest of the development and human right discourses is much more better reflected in sustainable development goals, the draft at least. So let us see that um, uh, how the international community agrees upon most of those things. And what do you think are the strengths and the weaknesses of the Sustainable Development Goals in regards to children's rights and education? Uh, I still see a big lacuna about addressing the problem of child slaves. The number of child laborers, as I said, has gone down. But the number of child slaves globally is stable. It is stagnated. 
According to ILO itself, five and a half million children are the victims of child forced labor or child slavery. And that number, in my opinion, has gone up. It did not go down. And we, if we keep on ignoring this, uh, I would say the, the most heinous crime against human civilization, child slavery, then we are not going to uh, achieve many of those things. Uh, to call ourselves more developed and advanced and educated and civilized, cultured. So child slavery must have no place in, in our society. And that is not mentioned at all. So I have been in contact with uh, several governments, but also with UN Secretary General. And he, in principle, agreed that it would be incorporated. So we want a very clear and explicit language uh, for abolition of child slavery in the development agenda and we cannot simply uh, ignore it. So that's one. And the second thing is that how, uh, however, there is different uh, places where the interconnectivity could be um, interpreted in such a way, but it would be better that we should have more clear indication that how we can go for more coordinated approach in dealing with the issues of children, like violence against children is there, child labor is there, forced labor is there, uh, education uh, is there. So how these goals which are affecting the lives of hundreds of millions of children in the coming 15 years uh, could be uh, seen and could be addressed in more holistic manner, in most coordinated manner. Do you think education is enough to end child labor? And if not, what do you think needs to change in current education systems um, in order to achieve this goal? Of course, education is uh, a cornerstone. Education is a cross-cutting issue for most of the development goals. Child labor is definitely one of them. We cannot think of eradication of child labor without ensuring good quality, free education as a fundamental human right for every single child. That is very clear. Because education is a preventive tool as well as the rehabilitative measure uh, on child labor issues. But it cannot work alone, let me tell you. The enforcement is one part. So the government should enact good laws and enforce them with uh, the priority and urgency and professionalism. So enforcement is one part. Another important area is the corporate social responsibility. In the globalized world, uh, the economies are being more uh, depending on the corporate sector and the corporate sector uh, is depending much more on the supply chain and value chain and the production chain. So how to ensure that no child is involved as child laborer in any of those production activities or supply chains? Uh, that has to be ascertained, that cannot come only through education suite. So we have to work uh, on several aspects, uh, enforcement, education and corporate responsibility to address the problem of child labor, beside many other things. What do you think can be done to better incorporate children's voices into policy making processes around the world today? Well, uh, this is an agreed principle that the children uh, themselves should be given platforms and voices uh, for their own issues. Child participation is one of the core principles of uh, UNCRC. Uh, so we have to devise uh, methods, for instance, how we can involve the civil society organizations who are directly working with the children, uh, child centers, uh, child related activities where they can uh, try to uh, work with the children and get their voices incorporated. Uh, so that's one way. We can involve teachers also uh, worldwide. So through the teachers organizations and teachers associations, the voices of children and their own uh, demands and their aspirations for the future development could be gathered uh, through them. Uh, then uh, communities, there are community institutions uh, where uh, the child participation could be ascertained in gathering the voices of children and feed them to uh, the development agenda. 
So through various institutional framework which are available, because the time is very short and in such cases we have to use the existing uh, institutional frameworks rather than creating new ones which is very, very difficult. Um, there are some youth organizations globally, uh, they should also be contacted. Um, the student unions are there in uh, high schools and uh, in adolescent places. So they could also be contacted. So this is, these are some ways where we can bring uh, the voices of children. And as a final question, I wanted to ask you, what advice would you give young people today who want to pursue a career as social activists and who want to make an impact upon the world? Well, this is an area where a lot of genuine and urgent attention has to be given. What I see worldwide, which I also mentioned in my uh, Nobel uh, acceptance speech, that I have a fear which I see, foresee, uh, in the coming many years, coming 10, 20 years, that the intolerance and impatience among young people is growing very fast. It is widening and it's deepening. They don't want to listen, they want to react first. Also because of uh, the growing ethnic, ethnical and communal sentiments. The young people are reacting uh, quickly about it. They are not so tolerant. What we have seen after uh, the so-called Arab Spring in most of those countries, the young people are not really satisfied. One reason I think that we as global community have not been able to uh, ascertain the security of their future and career. Secondly, we also fail to inculcate the values of global citizenship among young people, uh, the values of non-violence, the values of peace. Uh, they are lacking among young people because systematical, systematic and uh, deliberate efforts have not been made. Investment has not been made towards that direction. And that's why I am a big uh, supporter of uh, your institute uh, which is trying to inculcate those values among young people and that is very, very needed, very timely to address this problem. Uh, but we have to find more innovative ways that how we can involve the young people. I would say that in spite of all these intolerance and the violent attitude which is growing fast, uh, most of the young people still uh, are very idealistic. They are really looking for a better life for themselves and better life for the community and the world. We have to identify those people. We should give them voices, the voices of nonviolence and for peace, uh, voices for global citizenship. We have to build leadership among them and try to uh, give them the driving seat. And they should become their own pioneers and leaders and champions for the cause. So um, involvement of young people for the betterment of the world, for a nonviolent and peaceful world is a challenge, but it is also an opportunity. We should work on it all together. Of course, uh, for young people, um, sometimes I am uh, saying in the last uh, few uh, conferences in other places that we have already gone into the age of 3D. We, want, we wanted to see um, our televisions, 3D televisions, even our smartphones are going to be converted into 3D telephones so that we can shake hands without coming close. Uh, we can see all angles of uh, things around us through 3D. So my 3D suggestion for young people is, first D is dream. Dream for big, dream for better. Dream for betterment of yourself and dream for betterment of the whole world, for the whole humanity. So dream is one day. The second day is discover. Every young person has tremendous potential inside her or him. It has to be discovered. It has to be explored. The, the idealism is uh, a big spark. It's a big energy. Anger is a big energy. Um, let us transform that spark and anger uh, for the betterment of society. So discover the inner strength 
and discover the opportunities from outside. Uh, so this second thing is discovered. And the third important thing is do. Even if you dream and discover, and if you don't do, uh, then it won't work. So don't be lazy. Act now in what you believe. If you have big dream, act now. Discover your strength and power. Use your power. Use your dream to do as soon as possible. The time is running out. We have to do it now. Well, thank you so much for this wonderful interview and for your time. And we hope to be seeing you soon someday at UNESCO MJIP. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.